We are thrilled to have one of our fan favorites, Alyssa Ford Morrell, presenting today. She's a transplanted Californian who moved to Virginia 25 years ago. After a 25-year career in charitable fundraising, she left that field in 2012, the same year she went through Master Gardener training. Alyssa now has her own small business as a domestic concierge and gardener. Alyssa has loved gardening since childhood and started propagating plants in high school. She is one of the coordinators of the Glen Carlin Library Garden. She is also a master naturalist and serves as an Audubon at Home Ambassador, helping people certify their yards as wildlife sanctuaries. Uh, we are very happy to welcome Alyssa Ford Morell for Invasives in Your Garden. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you, Nicole. Such a nice introduction. Uh, and I'm really happy to be here today talking about invasives. Um, they are, oddly enough, one of my favorite topics uh, because we've all got them. And I've learned so much and I'm still learning new stuff all the time. Um, even though I'm the one making the presentation, some of you may know more than me um, in general or about specific invasives. So uh, any comments that you have will be welcome in the chat box. Let's just move right ahead here. We are going to have a pretty packed agenda and I'm going to try to keep us moving right along. What we're going to be talking about today is what invasives are. What does that really mean? I find that a lot of people don't truly understand what invasives are. Uh, we'll talk about what characteristics are common in invasive plants, how to know which plants are invasive, ways to get rid of them, which of course is, is what we really would like to do. Um, We'll talk just a little bit about herbicides. This is not a big herbicide presentation, but um, if we're gonna talk invasives, we have to talk a little bit about herbicides. Um, we're gonna look much more closely at 32 plants and one insect uh, that I find are very common in Northern Virginia. And of course, there are some people who are not from Northern Virginia here. Um, so not all of these plants will be invasive in your area. Unfortunately, it will be on you to uh, double check anything that I say, because while I'm confident that these things are invasive here, they may or may not be invasive if you're outside of Northern Virginia. We'll talk a little bit about replacements uh, for the ones that you might wanna replace. And this is a really important thing that I wanna say. This presentation is not about making anybody feel bad about what they've got in their yard. Um, all of us have made some bloopers in gardening and later learned better. I, because of the work that I do both as a volunteer, particularly as an Audubon at Home ambassador, where I go and visit people's yards and part of the visit includes looking at what might be invasive in their yard. And also because I do gardening work professionally, I am in way more yards than probably the average person by a long shot. And I have to tell you, I don't think I've ever been in any yard, including my own, that I couldn't find an invasive. Um, sometimes they're there by design and sometimes they're not by design, but we all have them. And this is not about making anybody feel bad about having them. It's about looking at what else we can do and how, how we can do a little bit better for the environment. So let's move forward. What is an invasive? Um, this it, photo, by the way, is porcelainberry, which we'll be talking about growing over the WNOD trail. And you can see what it does. Not always are invasives quite as obvious as this, where it's just taken over the landscape. Uh, many people use the terms invasive and aggressive interchangeably. Uh, they think that it's simply a description of what the plant is about, but in truth, that is not uh, the case. In this presentation, we are going to use the very strict definition of invasives based on Executive Order 13112, 
uh, which was created by the National Invasive Species Council. Uh, in 1999, President Clinton signed that executive order. And then in 2016, President Obama amended it just a little bit to make it a little more uh, inclusive. Uh, and this is some of the language from the amended version. Invasive species means with regard to a particular ecosystem, a non-native organism, so that's the first point, if it's native, it cannot be an invasive, whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human, animal, or plant health. So essentially there's two parts to this uh, definition. First of all, it has to be non-native, and then it has to be able to cause harm to health, to the economy, or to the environment. Most of the plants that we'll be talking about today are potentially causing environmental harm. But there are certainly some things that, some plants that can cause economic harm uh, or health harm. Um, and this species does include non-plants. It includes all sorts of other animals. We're only talking about one animal, an insect today, um, because it does tie in with the plants. Uh, this definition, as you'll notice, does not talk about how a plant behaves in the garden. It describes how it behaves when it gets out of the garden. It doesn't say anything about what it does in your garden. Um, and I'm going to emphasize that in this particular slide, invasiveness is not about how a plant behaves in your garden. And if you take nothing else out of this talk, I will feel really good if that is the thing that you remember. So just to really explain this, I have created this little graphic where we divide plants into native plants and non-native plants, because that's a hard and fast dividing line. And then we're going to rank them from plants that we desire, that we want to have, and plant down to plants that are not desired. Uh, the first group here that we're gonna look at are just general non-native and native plants that we like, um, you know, most, a lot of people like Asian azaleas, hostas, native plants that we might like include, you know, oak trees, which are the top of the keystone plant list supporting more insects than any of our other uh, native plants, uh, buttonbush, golden alexander. And then we have a line that describes that is an objective dividing line between how the plant behaves is it aggressive in reproducing and spreading or is it not aggressive? And under that line, we have some plants that may be desired on both non-native and native. Um, I'm not gonna read you all the names there. You can figure that out. Uh, the weeds then, that is a subjective term. I have always thought that the best definition of a weed is a plant that's in a place where you don't want it. And so it's all about you. And it can vary from one person to another. Um, some of the non-native weeds that most people agree they probably don't want include hairy bittercress, dandelion, nutsedge. But you know, some people do want dandelion. So again, as I said, it's a subjective thing. Some people like dandelion for um, edibility. On the native side, we have a number of plants that are quite aggressive and some people let them be in their yard and some people don't. The two plants that I typically do not allow in my own yard, even though they are native, are greenbrier and poison ivy. Vines in general, no matter whether they're native or non-native, they're generally quite aggressive. That is just their nature. Um, and I really don't want either of those potentially um, challenging vines in my yard, but I do allow heath aster in my yard that a lot of other people don't, avens, um, that sort of thing. Common milkweed, I allow common milkweed in my yard because I love how it spreads and supports monarchs, but it's really aggressive and it's not for somebody who likes a really tidy garden. But then we've got 
the invasive plants. And you notice they're only over on the non-native side uh, because they can escape cultivation and outcompete natives. And that includes things like the white mulberry tree, bush honeysuckle, garlic mustard, et cetera. I'm hoping that that really helps you see the difference between what is invasive and what is aggressive, but is not, does not fit the category of um, can escape cultivation and outcompete natives. So the characteristics of an invasive plant, and there are a number of characteristics that tend to be in common. First of all, by definition, it did not evolve in the place that it's occurring. It is not native. Uh, it has not been in the location that it's occurring for thousands of years. It likely evolved, however, in a similar client, climate. And what we do find is that many, many of the invasive plants in Northern Virginia are from somewhere in Asia, because it turns out that there's a lot of similarities between much of Asia and our climate here. On the West Coast, the climate seems to be more uh, similar to the Mediterranean. And so the invasives on the West Coast tend to be from the Mediterranean. Uh, often the invasive plant benefits from being away from the, its natural consumers or predators that keep it contained in its own place of origin. In other words, um, you know, a plant that evolved in, say, China had local insects, herbivores, maybe even larger animals that ate it. And while it didn't kill that plant, it tends to keep it in check. There's a balance. Nature always achieves a balance. And um, the thing is, when we bring the plant from one place to another, we very rarely bring the whole host of other creatures that would dine on it. And instead, it comes here and establishes and has very few creatures that uh, are going to keep it in check. It has an aggressive reproduction reproductive strategy. Um, and there are a number of them that can work well for an invasive plant. Often you find that the invasives will leaf out earlier than local plants or stay green longer after others have um, succumbed to, you know, the first frost. Uh, the invasive plant often puts out a lot of seed and it also often we find invasives spread aggressively by vining or by rhizomes or other means. Rhizomes are essentially, um, if you think of a cross between a branch and a root, it's a part of the root system that spreads out under the ground. And you're gonna see a lot of these plants that we talk about have rhizomes. So if you just think, about it being something like a branch under the ground. Uh, you've, you've just about got it right there if you're not familiar with rhizomes. Uh, native plants are often benefiting from our higher levels of carbon dioxide that are currently in the atmosphere uh, as climate change keeps progressing. Um, invasive plants generally do not provide good nutrient support to local wildlife or support diversity. Some invasives can provide support to limited numbers of species or be attractive, but without providing the nutrients. And let's just take a second to talk about that. Um, often an easy way to explain this is to talk about birds. In the Eastern hemisphere, bird migration tends to be shorter and a little bit easier. In the Western Hemisphere, most of our birds that migrate have to be able to make a really amazing journey over the Gulf of Mexico that takes incredible amounts of energy. And in order to do that, either flying north or flying south in, in fall, they need to have a lot of body fat built up in order to make that incredibly long journey that doesn't have a lot of stopping points. And in order to do that, they need to have some good uh, 
uh, fatty lipid acids in the food that they eat. They don't need sugar and carbohydrates. You know, you know for yourself what sticks on your body. They need the stuff that sticks on their body. And so the, the plants that evolved in Asia often don't have that. They give short bursts of energy. They're highly sugary and the animals like that sugar, um, but it doesn't really serve the purpose of what they need long-term. Uh, and here's another really important thing. Invasive plants, it's pretty rare that they're introduced for the first time and immediately are seen as invasive. Instead, they can be here for dozens or hundreds often of years before there's enough mass of these plants to start reproducing enough in order to be truly invasive. And again, they may be invasive in one location, but not in another, either because there's not enough mass for it or the weather just isn't right. A good example of this is pampas grass. On the west coast, pampas grass is quite an invasive. Here on the east coast, not so much. Um, we can grow pampas grass and you know, you may or you may not like it, but it has not escaped enough and it's not coming up in wild areas to the point where it's a problem. So how do invasive plants get into an area? And this, by the way, is um, a client's backyard. These are all invasives that he tackled. And I've got to tell you, it's, he's done such an amazing job getting rid of his invasives and replacing them with native plants. It's so impressive. Sometimes they get into an area by mistake. Um, that's actually, I, you know, I've always heard invasives can come in by mistake, and it's certainly true. But uh, in the ones that we're presenting today, I think there's only one that came in by mistake, and it was because it was in um, packing material that uh, nobody expected to, to get out, but it did. But sometimes things come in by mistake. Um, often, Invasives are imported deliberately because either they're good to eat, something tasty, um, often something that represents a flavor or, you know, special cuisine food that, that somebody from one country really loves in their home. And so they want it in, in the new place and they didn't realize, oh, gee, it's going to be uh, a problem. Uh, often they're thought to be good for the environment or for agriculture. And you will see as we're talking that there's plenty of these plants that were put in because of uh, thinking that they'd be good erosion control or some other benefit. And a lot of them are simply brought in because they are beautiful. And that is one thing that you will never hear me saying that invasive plants are ugly because a lot of them are really, really beautiful. They're just not good for our environment. Uh, many of them have taken a long time before the population builds up big enough to get out of control, as I just said. And it's also, I just want to point out, not uncommon to have a number of invasives showing up together. Um, sometimes one will prevail, but often if an area is uh, ripe for an invasion of one species, it'll be ripe for invasion of a number of species. And then you get a real tangled mess. So how do invasives show up in your yard? Not in an area in general, but in your specific yard. First of all, often they will grow from the seed bank. And if you're not familiar with that term, the seed bank is a collection of seeds that are dormant but viable either on or under your soil. These are seeds that have accumulated over the years, but for whatever reason, they, they did not uh, propagate, they didn't grow because something else was growing there, but they just settled in and decided to hang out and wait for their opportunity to grow. And often that is when the soil is disturbed or in some way uncovered, and then they start 
growing. This is why weeding can be such a frustrating thing because often by pulling out some of the weeds, you are actually exposing the ground for other plants to come up and it'll feel as if you've done no good at all. You've just created more, more invasives or more weeds. Seeds are often brought on in by the wind. There's a lot of plants that propagate by sending their seeds out on the wind. Seeds can be brought in by birds or animals who eat them in one place and poop them out in your yard. Gee, thanks. So kind of you to do that. Uh, seeds are often delivered via water, um, via streams or runoff. You will find often along our streams that there is quite a collection of invasive plants that move by water. Uh, I actually had a problem here. Uh, my next door neighbor had some plants planted that apparently uh, the nursery where these plants were being propagated must have flooded at some point and they had in them some lesser celandine seeds that only come up in the, the spring. And so suddenly this really nasty invasive uh, that usually is only along the streams was right next door to me. And so I had to work with my neighbors to try to get rid of those. Uh, invasives can grow over a property line from a neighbor's yard the same way they can grow over a property line into the wild. And that's what you're seeing here in this picture. And I am going to editorialize for just a moment here. I took this picture just a couple of weeks ago when I was helping um, Arlington's Invasives Coordinator document some, some stuff. And this on, on the front side is actually a wild forest that belongs to Arlington County. And on the back side is private property. And here growing over the property line is not only English ivy, but something that I'm not actually even going to be covering in our presentation because it's not that common. It's called yellow archangel. It's a beautiful plant that is being used here as a ground cover. But the fact of the matter is, it's a, a real problem. And as soon as the county found out that it was here, they had to move into place and address this problem and try to get rid of this. And unless that homeowner gets rid of it themselves, it's going to be an ongoing problem. And I suddenly started thinking, wow, this is a waste of money because Arlington County is going to be spending this money potentially over and over trying to keep the invasive out of the wild spaces. And the best thing would have been if the homeowner had just never planted it. And that's something to keep in mind if you're ever weighing in your mind, oh, I love this plant, but it's invasive. Um, you don't want to be responsible for, for raising everybody's uh, taxes, making us have to pay more. Uh, and then again, a lot of invasives were in your yard when you bought the property. Um, certainly, I'm, I will show you a shot of my backyard in a little bit that was completely covered with ivy when we bought it. And that's not an uncommon thing to have happen at all. Or you planted them. Oops. Uh, I have planted plenty of invasives. Um, very rarely knowing that it was invasive, it was usually because I didn't know it was an invasive. Uh, and I later regretted what I did. Um, but this is a real reality. And I want you to know that I am guilty of that sin. So I am not pointing any fingers. Here's an important question that people kind of frequently ask, can a non-native plant become native with enough time? And the logic of that makes a lot of sense. You know, if it's here for, for you know, 100 years, doesn't that make it native? Well, native really means that a plant has co-evolved with the uh, animals that eat it, the herbivores. And um, in fact, Many non-native plants are able to, when they move, they naturalize, which means that they're able to 
uh, integrate into the ecosystem, they're able to reproduce and sustain a population without human intervention, which would be an important part of becoming native, but it's not enough. When we compare the number of herbivores supported in a native community to the number of herbivores supported in the new community, naturalized plants support just a fraction of the ones uh, that they support in their native location, even when they've been naturalized for hundreds of years. And this little chart from Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home, is a good example. And I'm always interested in this one, eucalyptus, because I'm from California. And eucalyptus has been in California for here it says 100 years, and I think it's well more than 100. They're all over California. We think of them very much as, you know, California trees. Uh, well, the fact of the matter is, in Australia, they support 48 species. In California, they only support one. So good for that one species, but um, it's not in any way supporting what it co-evolved to support. A different one here, Phragmites. I generally make a couple of trips to Shinkatig every year with my bird watching husband to, to bird watch. And Phragmites is all over the Eastern shore and, and Shinkatig specifically. And it's been here for over 300 years. Um, in its native range, it supports 170 species, but here it supports five. So you can see it's really not doing what it's capable of when it co-evolved with insects. So while it is theoretically possible for an exotic species to become native and support local wildlife, the time frame for doing so is really in the thousands, tens of thousands, or sometimes even more um, in order to do so. So really, we're not talking about uh, an exotic species in practical terms becoming native. Uh, it's all about biodiversity and allowing a myriad of local species of plants and animals to thrive where they evolved. Um, we don't know which species is going to be the tipping point to say we've lost our biodiversity. What we really want is all around the world, not just here in America, but everywhere, we want to have that, that absolute uh, plethora of native species, each in their, er, their own area, being able to thrive instead of just a few species that are able to thrive everywhere. So how to know what plants are invasive? Uh, there's some wonderful resources and links on the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia website. Uh, and I've got it listed here and it's on your handout. I really want to call your attention to the more than 40 invasive plant fact sheets that are on the website. You can print them out. They're really wonderful. They really explain a lot about each of those plants. I use the fact sheets putting this presentation together. This presentation is not an exact duplicate of that at all. And in fact, the fact sheets suggest a lot more native alternatives than I'm going to be talking about here. We just have to pick and choose. And I decided that that's not what I'm going to emphasize. But if you want more choices, do go and look at those fact sheets. You can also on the same website um, get to, there are links to these other links here that have the Virginia invasive plants species list, the Alexandria and the Arlington County invasive plant species list. So if you are not sure if something is locally invasive, you can check it. Now, you may not be carrying that around with you. Uh, when I'm in a nursery and I'm not sure, I really like to app access my Flora of Virginia app, which is loaded with great information and will certainly tell you if a plant is native or not. Um, but uh, often it will tell you if it's invasive. 
And then other references that if you really want to dig into that I used in putting this presentation together are these two terrific um, books, The Plant Invaders of the Mid-Atlantic Natural Areas, and this cool little flip book that really has a lot of great pictures. And I have taken that out into the field with me a number of times when I need to uh, identify a plant, make sure that it is what I think it is instead of a lookalike, that sort of thing. And what's the best way to make sure you never plant an invasive plant? It's plant native plants. That is a guarantee that um, you're not gonna have an invasive plant. Uh, how can you keep out or get rid of invasives in your yard? You can weed them out by hand. Um, a lot of them when they're very small are just pull them out with your fingers. No, no problem there. In fact, a lot of the photos in this presentation uh, are I've pulled out exactly that way. Or maybe they're going to have a little bit more of a root and you need to use a tool. Um, you can install barriers. Um, certainly, if a neighbor has uh, something that wants to spread with rhizomes, you may want to put up along your fence line some sort of physical barrier, something that you dig down and bury in the earth. Um, even bamboo, there is a huge and thick plastic barrier you can do that with. Uh, you can smother plants, sometimes with landscape fabric. There are ways to solarize. You lay plastic sheets over a plant uh, or an area for quite a long time until everything underneath is cooked and dead. You can do one of the favorite master gardener tricks where you lay down newspaper or cardboard and cover it with mulch. The advantage of that is that it will break down with time and the water can get through. But often if it's a plant that is susceptible to smothering, the newspaper or cardboard uh, may well do the trick for you. Uh, certainly once you've gotten some invasives out, you can outcompete them by having healthy and abundant desired plants, particularly ground covers. And that's really a great goal is not just to leave bare dirt, but to put something else in a native ground cover that will um, keep any invaders out. You can use a chemical herbicide to kill plants. Um, and I use chemical herbicides like I use Tabasco. I use it rarely and carefully, but I do sometimes use herbicides when it's absolutely necessary. Um, a special note, when you do remove invasives from your property, you need to dispose of them quite carefully. You don't want to put them into a compost area where if they are not fully killed, they will spread the invasive. So put them with the true trash. Quick tips about herbicides. This is not a talk about herbicides. I'm not an herbicide uh, specialist, but sometimes they are necessary. So generally use herbicides as a last resort only when other things really aren't gonna work. Always know that um, what the invasive is that you're targeting and match the herbicide to it. That's really important. Not every herbicide works for every plant. Always read the directions and use herbicides according to the instructions on the label very important thing. Don't just freewheel with that herbicide. Some herbicides are really selective and kill only certain plants and some are very general and kill most or all plants. So again, depending on what you're trying to do, you want to match that herbicide to what you're trying to do very carefully. Herbicides have different methods of working, which um, you need to, again, match the herbicide to the plant, um, depending on whether a plant is a monocot or a dicot um, can make a big difference. Um, that's why you can get herbicides that will only kill the dandelion in the middle of your lawn um, because you can find an herbicide that will only work on the 
dicots instead of the grass, which is all monocots. Protect yourself and protect desired plants when you're using herbicides. And really, I, if I use an herbicide, I generally gown up and look a little bit crazy and I'll go to great lengths to protect desired plants, screen them out using newspaper or other things so that nothing can get on them. Um, but think ahead. There's a great chart that the Virginia Department of Forestry has put out. Um, and here is the link and it does give some specific recommendations. Uh, so that link is also in your handout. Um, a great way if you want to do your own research, which we really suggest uh, before using any herbicide is to end your search term with the uh, phrase site colon edu, which will take you to um, university websites, or site colon gov, which will take you to government research. Uh, and so you just put in your phrase and end it with one of those, and you'll, you'll get some good research, not just uh, somebody's opinion. And we are to the point of our first questions. We have a few questions here, Alyssa, so far. Okay. Um, one is about lesser selenine and how do you remove it? Because you mentioned how it spreads so easily. And do you have any tips for removing or eradicating it? Um, and as I said, I don't even have that in here. Um, if it's a very small infestation, it can be dug, particularly if you dig a wide uh, area around it and just create kind of a crater. The problem with lesser selenine is that it does have little nodules. And if you leave any of them behind, uh, they will come back, it will come back. Um, unfortunately, so often the infestation is not just a tiny infestation. So when it gets to be a lot, that's really impractical. And I do think it's going to be an herbicide use. I am not going to recommend which herbicide. Um, again, I just, that's not my area of expertise, um, but I know that there are, there's information about that. I will point out that lesser selenine is an ephemeral, meaning that it only comes up in spring and only lasts so long and then disappears. So you need to realize that just because you put the herbicide on and that the plant then disappeared, that doesn't mean that the herbicide was successful. You often, with some of these uh, invasives, need to reapply several years in a row until it simply doesn't come back. And that is what I had to do with, with the infestation that my neighbor had. Um, I worked with them and, and found the a, a good herbicide and did it very, very carefully. I myself actually painted, I used a brush and painted onto the leaves um, before they bloomed. So it was very early and I was able to keep it from blooming. So it wasn't able to reproduce by seed. And I was using the herbicide to kill the vegetation. Um, another eradication question is about uh, evening primrose and wild geranium invading a demonstration site in James City County. Uh, do you have any tips for that? Wow, um, I really don't. I have to say that the evening primrose that I'm familiar with is a native. And um, while I have dealt with having too much of it, we have found that it um, pulls out pretty easily and you can keep the numbers, um, you know, to where you simply want it to be. Um, again, the wild geranium that I'm not sure if they mean the native geranium, which <laughs> I'm actually trying to establish some native geranium in my own front yard, or um, one that's not native. Again, um, I think that pulling would probably work, but you've got to do it before it goes to seed. That's the key. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not an expert on the geranium. I'll try to research that and see if I can learn a little bit more. Sure. And, and then the questioner did just clarify that uh, he meant non-native geranium, not the native. Okay. Okay. Good. So, 
Um, there's been a nice conversation here about wood chips and um, using wood chips to either smother, or create borders. Um, you're nodding your head. Have you had success with wood chips as well too? Yeah, wood chips are great. Um, here in Arlington, there's both um, leaf mulch and wood chip mulch available free from the county. Um, and I've used it, both of them in both my home garden and at the demonstration garden that I co-coordinate. Um, the wood chips need to be pretty thick. Um, if you've got an area that has had invasives and you're trying to specifically keep invasives out, you may want to use some sort of barrier underneath it. Again, I am not a big fan of landscape fabric because it doesn't break down. Um, what I would prefer would be to um, put down either some newspaper or cardboard, put a big layer of wood chips, but then also plant native ground cover that's going to take over. And hopefully by the time those wood chips have broken down much, you're going to have some nice uh, ground cover that's taking over. Um, another question that came up um, was around when you were talking about the naturalization of non-native plants. Um, and I suppose during that discussion, you used the term here. And one of the questions that came up was whether when you said here, do you mean North America in general or here at like our specific region? I mean, anywhere. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly the sentence that I used, but um, in whatever location they are, if we're talking about naturalizing here or here in Northern Virginia or here in America, they're all going to behave the same. Uh, it's going to take a long time to um, co-evolve and start supporting the herbivores that are local to the area. Am I responding correctly to your question? I'm, I'm not sure that I understand fully. Right, well, the, the, I'm sort of reading into the question because the question didn't have a lot of specifics. It just said, when you say here, do you mean North America? That, that was the exact question. Yeah, so I, wherever you are. I mean, I think what I was saying is true in almost any location. It would be true if you're living in another continent. That's, that's <laughs> when you're okay. there, that's here. <laughs> Oh, no, and then the questioner just wrote in and said, yes, that's what she meant, invasive to North America. So your response okay. that it's going, as long as it's an invasive, it will have its invasive characteristics wherever it is within North America. Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And then just one last question, and I'm not sure if you might have something like this coming up, but when you, when you burst open and you mentioned your client's yard that you had rehabilitated with natives, and um, someone asked if you have any photos of that, just to see sort of the before and after of the invasives and then the rehabbed yard with natives. Um, I don't think I've got a before and after exactly. I do have some more shots from that yard and I'm sorry, that's, that, that is not a big thing that I have emphasized in this presentation, but it's a good idea and now I, I wish I had. Okay. Okay, we can, we can go on. Yeah. Okay, great. So I've broken these um, plants up into different kinds of things. And everybody watching will probably find that some of these things are an exception to the way that I'm grouping them. I'm really doing this based on my own experience. So I'm first talking about the invasives that just show up in your yard that you know you didn't plant. Uh, and then we'll move on to plants that somebody did plant. Um, again, these may there may be exceptions, but I've just broken them up this way because I found it useful. And in case anyone's wondering what we've got here, this is the um, sweet autumn clematis, uh, an invasive that's very common. Here we've got a collection of invasives. We've got mimosa, we've got porcelain berry, we've got uh, white mulberry, and I am I think this is probably vinca behind there, but I'm not 100% sure. 
So we're going to start with garlic mustard, which is common over much of Northern Virginia. It was originally brought from Europe and Asia as a, an herbal and erosion control plant. Um, saying that it's herbal is a little bit misleading. I have actually tried eating it. Apparently, um, it, it can be a little bit toxic. You have to cook it really well. Um, and even though it smells nice and garlicky, I got to say, I didn't like it at all. So I, this is not an invasive that I would recommend you try to get rid of by eating it. I just didn't find it particularly pleasant. It's very um, fibrous. Uh, so the texture was really bad. Um, it is a biennial member of the brassica family, meaning the same family as kale and broccoli and cauliflower. Um, it blooms in the second year with the plant setting up at about 7,000 seeds, which is an awful lot for a single small plant. The mature leaves have a heart shape with scallop edges. Uh, you can see the arrow there is showing one of those leaves. It's very much kind of a, a heart, but, but you know, zigzaggy edges. Um, the second year plant can grow up to three feet high. They're not all that high, um, but that's the maximum height. The first year plant is like with most biennials, much smaller. And the first year of almost any biennial is called a rosette. And it's, it's a sweet looking little thing. And the leaves are differently shaped. They're more round than heart shaped. Uh, you need to pull the plants before they set seed, which means if you're seeing the blooms like in these photos, it's time to pull them. You do not want them setting seeds. The seeds are set in these little um, seed pods here and they break open very easily. So um, I would recommend anytime you see garlic mustard, you see it, but often you don't notice it until it starts to go to bloom. Um, like all brassicas, it has four leaves in the shape of a, a cross there. So that's another good way to recognize it. Uh, some native butterflies uh, make the mistake of thinking that this is a plant that they can lay their eggs on. It has a scent that is apparently similar to the actual host plants for this butterfly, but the larvae eventually die because of the toxins in the plant. And I did not suggest any replacement because I can't imagine anybody ever planted garlic mustard and wants a replacement. Uh, Asiatic dayflower. Uh, this may be or may not be one that you've seen a lot of. I am extraordinarily fond of, of blue flowers. And so I always notice this one anytime I see it. Um, it is on both the Arlington and Virginia invasive species lists. It is identified by the two upper blue petals with one very tiny white petal in the bottom here. Uh, it is sometimes called a mouse flower because of the shape. You can see that kind of looks like Mickey Mouse ears. Uh, it's an annual and a monica and each flower blooms just for one day. Uh, that's why it's called the day flower. The stems are quite succulent and they're divided by nodes that can reroot. Uh, so if you were to take a piece of this and drop it on the ground, it may root. Uh, it can be dug out, though you have to remove all the roots and it ha can have quite a large fibrous uh, root ball. So I would recommend that you do that on a day after a good rain, rather like today, we had good rain last night, uh, and, and dig a ways out and assume that you'll need to fill in with some soil, that you'll, you're going to be removing some soil in order to get all those roots. Um, don't confuse it with the Virginia day flower, which I don't really think is very common. And it looks very similar to this, except that instead of that one little white uh, petal at the bottom, it has a somewhat larger blue petal that, that matches. And if you would like to replace this, I suggest using 
our native spiderwort, the Traviscancha virginiana, uh, which is a beautiful bluish purple flower and is um, really pretty. Japanese stilt grass. This is the one plant that was accidentally introduced in uh, 1919 as packing material. The one plant I'm saying in this presentation that it was accidentally introduced. Uh, it is on the invasives lists for Alexandria, Arlington, and all of Virginia. Uh, it's an Asian native that when it's happy, it can grow to three feet tall. I have seen it um, taking over a huge yard uh, where they kept it mowed, but not tightly mowed. And this huge, huge lawn was essentially all Japanese stilt grass. Um, it is an annual, it dies back each winter and then germinates in this, re-germinates in the spring. Uh, the small seeds remain viable for up to five years and can disperse really easily. Uh, anything that walks through, the, the seeds can attach to the legs uh, of an animal walking by or humans, and each plant can have a thousand seeds. Uh, deer don't eat the stilt grass, but they do spread it on their hooves. Uh, it forms dense clumps that crowd out native plants. It's quite easy to identify because it's got this silver streak that is just off center. Uh, and it's, it's pretty indicative. And small infestations can be pulled because the roots really are shallow. Um, and you can also use pre-emergent herbicides um, like you would do with crabgrass. Uh, in order to deal with the larger infestations. But once it's widely spread, it can be real hard to get rid of. Again, I'm not suggesting an alternative. I mean, we've got lots of beautiful native grasses, but I doubt that anybody who has Japanese stilt grass is saying, oh, I want something similar to replace it. They probably just want it gone. So uh, it is, this is something that is a little, interesting. People will try to argue, well, it hosts two of our native butterflies, so it must be okay. They use this as an argument that um, invasive plants can become native. Well, the fact of the matter is those butterflies would probably prefer the actual native plants. They're lucky that this is close enough chemically and biologically that their babies can survive on it. But it's incredibly rare that any plant can do this. And the only caveat then is that you don't really want to be pulling this or, or getting rid of this grass at the time that the butterflies may be laying eggs. If you find that you've got these uh, native satyr butterflies uh, around your Japanese stilt grass, you may want to be careful about when you remove it, but I would still encourage you to remove it uh, at a time that the butterflies aren't using it, and those butterflies will find native plants to lay their eggs on, undoubtedly. Star of Bethlehem, and um, I'm going to give a shout out to my friend Elaine Mills, who provided these photos to me. I, you'll see throughout the presentation how generous she has been in letting me use some of her wonderful pictures that she has. But what's so funny about this is that I have this Star of Bethlehem in my yard. It's a real problem for me. And I don't know why I didn't take pictures of it, except that I think every time I've had to deal with it, I've been so upset about it that I didn't even think to take the pictures. It's a real problem. In my yard, what happened was that we had lawn that had been mown for many years. And then at the beginning of 2020, we got rid of the lawn and replaced it with native plantings. And all of a sudden, I realized how much of this Star of Bethlehem, because it had always been being mown down and it never bloomed. Instead, it had spread widely without ever blooming. And now I've got this nasty infestation that I'm dealing with. 
It is a European native ephemeral that has been cultivated in America since the 1800s. It's very pretty. Again, a lot of invasives are really pretty. Not going to try to argue that it isn't. Um, I found it interesting that it's in the asparagus family. Uh, all parts of it are toxic, so don't go trying to taste it. Um, it is named as an invasive in Alexandria and the Mid-Atlantic region generally. Uh, it spreads both by seeds and by bulbs. As I said, in my yard, we figured out it had been spreading without ever blooming, which means that the bulbs uh, were what was spreading. Uh, it's very difficult to eradicate. It does not respond well to herbicides. Um, I found that there's only one that has a chance of working on it. And it has a narrow window to be targeted because it's an ephemeral. You have to get after it in the short window in spring when it is available. And I have been digging I every week while it's up. I put aside an hour or two just to dig out patches of these bulbs. And I'm slowly making some progress, but it is very frustrating. Um, it is distinguished by this um, very distinctive whitish midrib running the entire length of the rib. Um, it, the, the leaves are very strappy and look a lot like grape hyacinth. Um, and in fact, I have some grape hyacinth, which is not considered invasive growing amongst mine. And so that's how I am able to distinguish between them. Uh, if you are in that position that you can get rid of the Star of Bethlehem and want to replace them, I don't think that Virginia has anything more beautiful than the delicate little spring beauty, the Claytonia virginica. Uh, and anytime you can get some spring beauty in your yard, it's a happy day. Porcelain berry. This is um, a real common uh, plant that was <laughs> one that I, when I first moved to Virginia, did not have any idea what it was. And I nurtured it because I thought, what beautiful berries. Porcelain berry was brought from Northeast Asia and widely planted starting way back in the 1870s as a landscape plant. It is still available in the nursery trade. Uh, it spreads by vining growth and when the berries are eaten by birds and spread widely. The berries are gorgeous. They are green, teal, blue, and purple, as you can see in the photo. It grows really quickly and forms huge mats that overwhelm and shade out other plants. Uh, the young plants are really easy to pull. Uh, you can see it's not a very big root early on. And I have to say all three of those shots are porcelain berry from my own yard. And I probably pull, just as I walk around my yard, probably a dozen of these a week. They're super easy. I just pull them. I don't even do anything with them. I just lay them on the ground and, and they die. I had thought if I wanted to, I could do a whole collage where I just lay one photo over another, over another, over another. Um, but they're very easy to remove when, when they're young. It's a much bigger challenge when you have a lot of it. Um, Arlington County uh, has a lot of porcelain berry and they spend a lot of time and effort and money getting rid of it. Uh, tendrils grow opposite the leaves. The mature leaves develop toothed lobes. You can see that's a very different looking leaf than the baby ones. It looks very similar to native wild grape. And um, people are often worried, oh, if I pull this, I might be pulling our native wild grape. First of all, I have to say, we should be so lucky that the wild grape spreads as easily as the porcelain berry. That just doesn't really happen. But there is an easy way to tell them apart. Um, and that is if probably not on the very tiny babies, but as they get bigger, if you snip the stem, the center of the porcelain berry has a white pith in the middle. 
uh, grape pith is brown and the porcelain berry is white. And my friend Jenny McNair has been wonderful to point out that China is white and uh, China is what porcelain is. <laughs> and so if you could link the idea of white China and China being porcelain, then you can remember that that pith is white. And if you want to replace some porcelain berry, I would recommend our native cross vine, Bignonia caprolata, which is a beautiful native vine. Oriental bittersweet, Celastris orbiculatus. Uh, bittersweet is something that I mistakenly nurtured in my own backyard. I thought it was a small shrub. It kept doing this funny thing at the tips where it looked like it wanted to turn into a vine and I kept snipping them off, but it turns out that that's one of the distinctive things about the plant is that it wants to vine. I finally figured out that it was an invasive and removed it. It's a woody perennial that was introduced from China around 1860 and um, unfortunately is still in the landscape trade. It's on invasive lists for uh, Arlington, Alexandria, and Virginia. It can grow up to 90 feet. You can see here it is in this tree uh, with its fruit still set there. Uh, it strangles trees by girdling them and by excessive weight. Uh, girdling meaning that it can wrap tightly around it and it does not extend as the tree tries to grow. So, um, it's, it's like trying to put on pants with too tight of a waistband that have, has no stretch and then you eat a whole bunch and it's very painful and you can't ever take those pants off. Uh, this vine will strangle by girdling. Uh, it reproduces by rhizomes and by root suckering and by seeds that are dispersed by birds and mammals. Uh, nurseries often confuse the native and the non-native species. So I do advise that if you want to grow the American bittersweet, that you buy it from a reputable natives only vendor or a, a vendor that really knows what they're talking about. Uh, the roots have a very distinctive orange color. And I'm sorry, this photo doesn't really show it that well, but any time I've ever pulled, I mean, this is not just my observation, uh, but any time I've ever pulled the root, you see the orangey, yellow orangey color to it. And it does have the vining tips to it. And I do suggest that um, why not, if you like the look of it, go ahead and get the American bittersweet, the Celastra scandens as a replacement. Japanese honeysuckle. This is an invasive that we have all over our wild spaces, particularly along the edge of trails and it blooms in the spring and it has a really pretty smell and the flowers are very attractive. Uh, it was introduced on Long Island in 1806. We know very specifically and it has been sold as an ornamental and for erosion control and for wildlife forage. Um, so a lot of qualities that are good, but the vines overtop desired plants and twine about and cover small trees and shrubs and it can girdle young trees. And it just reproduces like crazy. It grows five to 14 feet in a year. The, Seeds are eaten by birds and then pooped out all over the place. Uh, it is semi evergreen. It has opposite leaves, you can see, and a hollow pith where if you cut the vine, it will always be hollow. Um, you can see how thickly it grows here. I don't know if you can see, there's actually a face here. This was a master gardener who was working over at the Glen Carlin Library Garden. Uh, when we decided that we were going to get rid of the Japanese honeysuckle that had been growing on the fence. Um, 
uh, bordering the garden. And it was so thick, the only way to get it out of there was to actually put it over his back and, and walk it out like he was a human vine. It was very funny. Um, by the way, that took us a few years to actually get rid of the Japanese honeysuckle. Um, we cut it way back as far as we could. The trunk had grown into the fence and each time it would re-sprout, then we did come at it with a very careful use of an herbicide. Uh, you can hand pull the sprouts pretty easily, cut the large stems and paste the ba base with herbicide. And if you have it and you wanna replace it, one good one is to replace it with native trumpet honeysuckle. This is my trumpet honeysuckle on the front of my house just this past year. And I love it. And right now the hummingbirds are really enjoying my honeysuckle. Wineberry, Rubus phonicolasius. I am trying to do that. I can't get it to roll off my tongue easily, unfortunately. Uh, this is an Asian berry that was introduced to America in the 1890s as breeding stock for raspberries. They were hoping to uh, breed them together and, and develop raspberries in that way. Um, its invasive habit started being recognized in the 1970s and it's spread throughout much of the East Coast. Uh, it has reddish stems and unfortunately, um, this one is really young. It's the only one I, I found when I was out looking for photos of its hairy, thorny um, habit. But often it's much redder. It's as red as you can see on this other photo, this very red stem. Um, it has bright red berries and the red hairs on the stems are quite distinctive. Uh, it also has this big middle leaf of three. There are, they, it grows in clusters of three, and the middle one is always considerably larger, which is how I recognize this one, which was the very first one that had popped up in my own yard, and it popped up about two and a half weeks ago. I was quite dismayed about that. I got out my little hand tool and popped it out, and here it is, um, so that you can see a different angle of it. It reproduces from berries and when the canes touch down. Uh, you can dig it out or use herbicides, uh, particularly if it's a big plant and it's got a big root that is hard to dig out, you can cut it down to the ground and then paint those canes if you want. And if you want to um, replace it with something, look at a beautiful thornless blackberry. Um, this is one that we have growing over at the Glen Carlin Library Garden and um, it's just coming into ripeness now and people walk through and help themselves to the berries and nothing's going to um, prick them because it's thornless, which is super nice. Bush honeysuckle, a close cousin, but it's a bush, not a vine. Um, the bush honeysuckle is um, Lanicera macchii, and it was introduced as an ornamental in 1897. And in the 1960s, people were using it for soil stabilization. One of my Glen Carlin co-coordinators said that his brother worked for the Forest Service and they were planting this all over the place back in the 60s. Um, it's invasive throughout Northern Virginia. The seeds are dispersed by birds and small animals. Um, the, bir the, the birds really like the berries, but again, does not have the high fat content that's needed for the long migration. When it's small, you can easily pull it out, but larger ones um, can get really big and need to be dug out or cut and poisoned. Um, it has the opposite leaves and the branches all have this very distinctive hole in it. In fact, even the, the thinnest branches, if you can uh, cut it, you'll and look really closely, they've, they've all got that hole. It's very distinctive. It has a fountaining habit that I 
personally find very distinctive and I'm able to recognize it even in, in winter just by the growth habit. Um, the bush terminology can be deceptive. This is me a few years ago, I was doing an invasive poll and um, I had just explained to someone how to recognize bush honeysuckle and he pointed across the ways. He said, oh, is that one over there? And I said, I kind of squinted because I didn't have my glasses. I said, oh no, I think that's just way too big. But I walked over and took a look and then I came back to him and apologized. I said, no, that's totally a bush honeysuckle. It's just not a bush. It's more of a tree. And I have since seen ones that are even bigger than this. Um, if you have them and you want to replace them, uh, I think that there's nothing prettier than the Calacanthus floridus. The cultivar Athena has this really cool colored uh, bloom. The straight species also has a beautiful bloom that is a deep kind of purple brown. It's really, really lovely. Tree of Heaven, Alianthus altissima. And um, a lot of people who start dealing with Tree of Heaven say that's a very bad name. It's, it's the Tree of Hell. Um, it was brought from China in the late 1700s as a shade tree, which it certainly does provide shade. It forms thickets because the roots spread and send up sprouts. Uh, it's a dioecious plant with female trees producing more than 300,000 seeds annually, which are wind dispersed. I used to have so many babies coming up in my yard. This one, which was just a few weeks ago in my front yard, um, is now a little bit more rare because my neighbor who had an Alianthus uh, one street over cut it down. It got rid of it. Uh, appropriately a couple years ago, but there's still seeds around. I used to be afraid that it was poison ivy because it's leaves of three, but it looks quite different than a poison ivy sprout because it's got this really long skinny middle uh, part of the, the three leaf pattern. Um, it's a lilopathic, which means that it produces a chemical that can keep other plants from growing. Uh, seeds prolifically and grows vigorously 10 to 14 feet in the first year. It is difficult to get rid of the mature tree without chemicals because um, if you were to do what works with so many trees where you cut all the way around the tree so that it's unable to transport the fluids or the energy up and down the tree, it will react by sending up a lot of new shoots from the roots. So instead, a lot of people use that, what is known as the cut and squirt method, where they'll cut into the trunk and put the herbicide into the cut, the systemic herbicide, which will be sucked down into the roots and go into all the parts of the plant to kill the tree before they actually try to cut it down. Um, compounds in the leaves, are really helpful. This tree can be hard for the amateur to tell apart, the amateur and me. I have a hard time telling this tree apart from black walnut, from sumac, from a number of plants that have very similar compound leaves like this. But it's got this one factor that if you pick one of these leaves and just break it and crush it a little bit in front of your nose, it has a very distinctive scent that is kind of like peanut butter, but not peanut butter you would wanna eat. It smells dis distinctly rancid or bad, and that's very distinctive. If you are going to get rid of an Alianthus, consider the liquid amber, uh, the wonderful sweet gum tree that is so beautiful every fall. Now, here is our one non-plant invasive that we have to mention uh, when we're talking about the Alianthus. Um, this is a new insect that has just started making a foothold in Virginia, and we've started getting reports of it in Arlington. It's not widespread, um, but we want to know every spotted lanternfly that comes into Arlington. 
It's really distinctive looking. This photo on the left is one that I took just um, last month when my husband and I made a visit to Philadelphia. We were in a garden and I looked down and I was horrified to realize, oh my gosh, there's the insect that I've only heard about. Um, that's a, a young stage of its development. It goes through this black with white spots and then it becomes uh, red and black with white spots and then it, it grows its wings and um, it's a really pretty insect but that is really, really horrible for agriculture and landscape plants. Um, its favorite host tree is the Aelianthus, although it likes plenty of other trees also. Um, there's a whole web page that the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia has put up about it, which includes a reporting form and an entire presentation about the spotted lanternfly. Uh, this is the link. It's in your handout. We urge you to uh, familiarize yourself with what this insect looks like and report it if and when you see it. Um, don't just squish it and then say, oh, yeah, I saw it. Um, in these early days, it really helps to have a photo taken um, of it. So that's the spotted lanternfly. On to white mulberry, the Morris alba. This is a native of China that was brought over in the 1600s. This is one of the most interesting things I learned in putting this presentation together is that in 1624, the Virginia legislature required that every male resident needed to plant at least four, four white mulberry trees in order to promote a North American silk industry. Now, I don't think it really got going, but there you have it. Um, this was a plant very deliberately brought into America. It is very much on the invasives list. It is unfortunately outcompeting our native red mulberry because it hybridizes and it spreads a harmful root disease to the red mulberries. The leaves have serrated edges and they can vary from this kind of heart shape that you see here. This is one that is growing in a crack in my driveway. And because it's in a crack, I cannot seem to get at the roots. So I just chop it off uh, every month or so. And um, so the leaves are always this young kind of uh, heart shape, but when they get older, they develop these um, kind of creative looking uh, divots and lobes, uh, sinuses in, in these leaves. Um, so there can be a lot of variation even on the same plant. Um, they have um, a glossy leaf. The native red mulberry is not glossy. A single tree can produce 20 million seeds. This is part of why we have so many of them. Easy to pull when they're young, uh, but mature trees need to be cut and the stump ground out, or you can girdle the tree in order to kill it. Um, consider replacing it with a beautiful black gum. I have Nyssa sylvatica in my own backyard and love it. Siberian elm. This is another one that we end up pulling a lot of. Um, I pull it out of my own front yard all the time, these young ones. It was introduced in the 1860s and unfortunately is still available in the nursery trade. Invasive in a lot of places. The seeds travel by wind and end up a long ways away. I do not know where the parent tree is of the, all the babies that come up in my yard. Um, it has opposite scalloped leaves with a strong mid vein, and it's, it's quite a tough, um, it's, it's not a delicate leaf at all. It's quite leathery. Uh, you can pull it pretty easily when it's small. If you want to replace it, look at the beautiful red maple, the Acer rubra. Uh, much better plant. And we are at our second spot for questions. Okay, so we have a few that have come up in the second round. Um, one question we received was about stopping the transfer of invasives from property to property, especially uh, with landscape companies sometimes inadvertently transferring things. Do you have any tips or tricks on how to help stop that? I 
don't, except for very polite vigilance. The more you talk about it to people, the more they learn. I do feel that most um, transfer would be out of ignorance, not from people who know. Um, I, I really feel that it's a good idea to be involved with what you're planting. I see all the time installations of plants going in where you know a nursery has been hired to plant and they just plant what's popular and often it's invasives. Um, I don't know if that helps, but I think you've You've just got to talk about it all the time. I don't think that there's a lot of stuff that's inadvertently going on. Um, most of the seeds that come into a yard are going to be transferred, not so much by a professional person who has it on their clothing, but rather by wind and, and animals. Another uh, eradication question actually is about poison ivy. And if you have any uh, tips about eradicating poison ivy. You know, that is a real good one. And I, I will talk about it only briefly because we've, we've still got a lot to cover. Um, and, and I do know that there are people who allow poison ivy to grow in their yard. I do not, as I've already stated, and I've also eradicated it on behalf of other people, I do not do it with chemicals. Um, instead, I just gown up, you know, I everything when I deal with poison ivy is done very deliberately. I wear long pants, long sleeves, I will tape my gloves to my sleeves, I will tape my pants to my socks, um, and I will look for products. There are products you can put on your skin before you're exposed, which help the oil not stick to your skin. And I will just go in there with often I'll use plastic bags turned inside out um, and deal with it the way you do with, with doggy poop. When you're picking up poop, you know, I'll try to surround the plant with a inside out bag and then pull from there and and encase the whole thing, because I sure don't want to put it in the trash and give it to the trashman. Um, and then I always make sure that I go inside and shower really well afterwards. Um, it really depends on how much you've got. I have dealt with poison ivy growing up a tree, which I went ahead and did the same way. And we'll be talking about this with ivy, where you cut it down at a much lower level you kill what's growing and that can that may be done if you've got something that's a big thick trunk of poison ivy you will probably need to paint that open cut with um, some sort of herbicide that will go down but then let the upper part die unfortunately as those parts that are dying in the tree dry up and drop off they are still going to have the the oil that could get a reaction. And so you have to be really vigilant about cleanup for as long as that is drying. I, I hope that helps on a quick and easy. <laughs> yeah, I know it, it can be difficult with it. Um, another question we had was just is whether bush honeysuckle is also known as a more honeysuckle? Yes, yeah. yes, okay. yes. Okay. Um, and then start just really quickly, because I know we're pressed for time to close the loop on the first question about the, the inadvertent transfer. Uh, the questioner was really wondering with equipment, like with lawn mowers, if there's things that are attached to the mower and they're going from lawn to lawn. That's interesting. And I am really not aware of whether that's a big problem or not. Um, I would, if you've got somebody who comes in with an outside lawn mower, ask them if they could please clean the bottom of the lawnmower before they come over. Um, and I, I think that's a reasonable thing. If you're working with a company over and over, you can say, hey, we're trying really hard not to have invasives and um, not knowing who's, 
who you've just worked with and what they've got in their yard, could you please make sure that that before you leave their yard and come to mine, that that you make sure that there's nothing crusted up in that lawnmower or on its tires. Fair point. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll keep going. And by the way, um, both of these shots are of wisteria growing up into large trees. So here are invasives you or a previous owner thought you wanted. Uh, Italian arum, arum italicum. This is a really pretty semi-evergreen plant that was introduced from Europe. It's sometimes called orange candle flower or sometimes Italian lord or, lords and ladies, which I think is a really fun name. People love this because it is green through the winter uh, and it, it is very pretty, let's acknowledge that, but it is invasive in many parts of the country. It spreads rampantly, it dies back uh, in the fall excuse me, it emerges in the fall when other plants are dying back. And it sets these seed heads. Um, I don't have a photo of the red seed heads, but it turns bright red. Um, and it's attractive to birds and animals. Um, all parts of it are toxic and can cause skin irritation or illness and death if consumed. Uh, it has tubers that must be removed and which are herbicide resistant. Uh, repeated hand digging is likely needed. I have to say, it's a real problem. We have had this at Glen Carlin. We have one volunteer um, who is wonderful. She makes a look for where we've had the arum um, every couple of weeks. And if she sees a little bit coming, she redigs and she's really good at getting down and trying to get all the roots, but it still keeps coming back. Our infestation has dwindled and dwindled through time, but they're still coming back. So you really have to be diligent about this. Uh, a great replacement is our native wild ginger, a serum canadense. This is in my backyard. I love this as a native ground cover. Exotic bamboo. There's a bunch of different kinds of bamboos. I'm kind of loop, you know, grouping them all together this way. Uh, golden bamboo, which is one of the most common, was introduced in the southern United States before 1870 for both ornamental purposes and erosion control. I know that a lot of people who have it today like it for privacy because it is tall and thin. Um, it, it, but it is highly invasive and it is so hard to get rid of. It spreads like crazy. It forms this really dense single species thicket through rhizomes. It can grow to be 30 feet tall. Um, it's a bad one for mosquitoes because mosquitoes will lay their eggs in the water uh, that collects inside the stalks. Uh, there is no value in the native uh, to, to native North American wildlife species. People will often talk about all the birds that are in bamboo, but it tends to be two species of invasive birds, the house sparrow and starlings, that um, they're pretty much the only birds that are ever in the bamboo. Um, it can really cause some property damage to sidewalks, driveways, et cetera. Um, and some people don't want to buy a property that has bamboo. I have to say, I had experience with bamboo long before I became a master gardener. I worked for a nonprofit that had homes for people with disabilities. And one of our homes had a bamboo grove that we wanted to contain. And we kept bringing volunteer groups in to try to dig the trench and put in the, the bamboo limiting plastic. And we went through dozens of groups who would only be able to dig through a small part of those roots. Finally, this law firm that came in and they heard the story after they'd spent a day doing it and hadn't been able to dig through those roots said, we are going to get this done for you. And they paid to rent equipment to come in and limit that bamboo growth. Um, 
it is a real pain to deal with. Um, you can kill it if you paint it and then do paint the cut, cut it and paint it with an herbicide, but you may have to redo that a few times. Uh, if you are using it for privacy, the way that I was saying, I suggest considering Arborvitae, which is another tall, thin, native evergreen, Thuja occidentalis. Japanese knotweed. This is another one uh, that has real estate consequences, um, particularly in the United Kingdom. It was introduced in the UK in 1825 as an or ornamental and then to the US in the late 1800s, sometimes to control erosion, but it started being recognized as a problem in the UK by the 1930s. It forms really dense clumps that grow to be three to nine feet high. It reproduces by seeds and by large rhizomes that can reach 18 feet in length. Um, those rhizomes can break off and travel by water. Uh, it has oval leaves. I tend to think of them as a little bit shield shaped because they've, they've got these kind of edges down here at the corners and then the, the tip, the stems are often reddish and the stalks are hollow. And apparently when you cut those stalks, they can be really sharp. Um, small infestations can be dug, but the larger ones usually require some, some sort of chemical control. Um, it can really damage hardscape. They uh, estimate that in the UK, uh, any property with uh, Japanese knotweed will drop in value by about 15%. And there's some real legal issues that if someone has tried to uh, hide the fact that there's Japanese knotweed by just cutting it back shortly before sale, they can be sued after uh, the sale if the plant reemerges. Um, if you've got it uh, and want to get rid of it and replace it, I highly recommend the beautiful Virginia knotweed, Persicaria virginiana, which is very pretty and um, easy to grow. English ivy. I did promise you that I would show a picture. This is what my backyard looked like when we bought our home. It took us a year and a half to eliminate the ivy, but um, it is gone. Uh, it was introduced by European colonists in 1727. We know very precisely. It's invasive over much of North America. It flourishes and, and light, is well liked because it's an evergreen that grows in both sun and shade, and people really think that's a great thing. Um, people often think it's good at erosion control, but it's not. It has very shallow roots, and often the whole plate of ivy can, can slip if there's a lot of uh, water to deal with. It harbors rats, ticks, and mosquitoes. Uh, it has a pathogen that can be toxic to native trees. It climbs trees, cutting off light and adding weight. It only reaches sexual maturity when it goes up high. This happens to be a patch that for some reason reached sexual maturity where I could photograph it. You can see that the leaves change shape and there's the fruit that gets eaten by birds. Uh, on trees, you can cut the stem at the base and again, higher up creating a, a several foot window. You let the vines above die and pull out the, the vine, the roots below. There's some really good information on the Arlington Regional Master Naturalist website. I've got the link here. Uh, after hand removal, only about 20% will return the next year if you don't use herbicides. That's how I did it. I hand pulled it all and 20% in a second year actually turns out to be pretty easy to remove. And then 20% of 20% is just about nothing. So I'm only now worrying about um, incoming uh, seedlings. Uh, it can be controlled if you love ivy and want the look. You can put some in a pot if you keep it clipped so that it doesn't wander off anywhere and it never sets berries and you can enjoy it in your pot. But if you'd like to replace it, you can consider golden ragwort, Pacara aria. This is 
uh, beside my driveway. And the Pakara Aria can take sun or shade and it's semi evergreen. And you get the bonus that once a year in the spring, you get these beautiful yellow flowers. Chameleon plant. This is a real nasty one to control. It is um, used in Far Eastern cuisines. Apparently, a lot of Asian dishes use this. And it's also very pretty. Um, these photos don't show that some, some plants actually have quite a bit of red on them. Um, so it's very pretty. Um, and it's actually not on the, our invasive list yet, but the Arlington Invasives Plant Coordinator, when I spoke with her, she said, oh, she said, do cover Hutania cordata because this would be a nightmare if it got into our wild spaces. And I have dealt with um, four different clients who have dealt with this and they will concur, it is a nightmare. It also has some, some people have an allergic reaction to it, has a very distinctive and strong scent. I feel like it's a cross between fishiness and cilantro, if that makes any sense. Um, it can grow to be a foot and a half high. It likes moist habitats. Um, so it probably won't grow where it's super dry but it spreads both by seed and brittle rhizomes. And it's those rhizomes that are a real problem. And I got a picture here of some that I dug out. And you can see that they break off super easily and any part that is left in the ground will re-sprout. Uh, that is why um, only small patches can really be dug out. I have done that successfully. I got the ground quite wet and very carefully lifted out large parts and sifted through everything and redid it about four times. Uh, but we did conquer that small patch, but a larger patch, you really are going to need an herbicide. Um, if you do get rid of some and want to replace it, I'm recommending foam flower, Tiarella cordifolia, which is a really beautiful native um, plant. Chinese silvergrass, Miscanthus sinensis, is an Asian the, uh, native that was introduced for ornamental purposes in the late 1800s. And it's a very pretty grass. Um, and it's, it's pretty even in the winter. Uh, but it's been deemed invasive throughout much of the mid-Atlantic. It also is a, a fire risk, which is not something to sneeze at. Uh, it outcompetes and crowds out native vegetation. It is wind dispersed, the seed will go everywhere. It also spreads as clumps, so it gets fatter and fatter um, by rhizomes. Uh, there are cultivars bred to be infertile, but we're finding that they can revert if we learned anything from Jurassic Park. We know that things that should be infertile don't always stay infertile, uh, can be removed by digging. Although if you do do that, you need to be aware that there's, it's probably built up a big seed bank. And so you'll need to, after the fact, pull the sprouts out or it can be removed and new growth treated with herbicide if you cut it way back. Um, and to replace it, consider our beautiful native switchgrass, Panicum brigatum. This is a shot over at the Glen Carlin Library Garden. Sweet autumn clematis, clematis turnifolora, is something, a beautiful white flower that can spread everywhere, introduced from Asia in the late 1800s. It's still available in the nursery trade. I've seen it in catalogs, um, but it's highly invasive. You can see here's an example of how the leaves persist after native vegetation has been killed by the cold. It's, it's not that it's it will make it through the winter, but it gives it a competitive edge. It can climb to 20 feet and sprawls over wide areas. You can see here how it just spreads out. Uh, it has huge numbers of wind dispersed seeds. Uh, you can pull the seedlings, mature plants can be dug, but large infestations may need herbicides. Uh, to replace, do think about the Virgin's Bower. This is on the front of my house, and I just love how many uh, pollinators the Virgin's Bower attracts. It's really pretty. 
and really popular with the pollinators. Periwinkle, Vinca minor, this is something that we've got all over the place. It was introduced as a ground cover way back in the 1700s lists. It's evergreen and has a very sweet blue purple flower that is easy to grow, but the leaves and seeds are toxic to wildlife and it has no nutritional value. It's an aggressive spreader that can cover large areas of woodland. You can see this is a woodland infestation here. Again, it's not about how it behaves in your yard. It's about how it behaves when it gets out of your yard. The rhizomes can extend to over six feet. Um, digging can work for small patches. You can mow it down um, quite a bit and uh, then put on a systemic herbicide. This is over at Glen Carlin. We have tried to dig this vinca out. Um, I personally dug out vinca at Glen Carlin and it comes back. We have to keep working on that one. Um, you can use it if you really love it. Uh, you can use it as a spiller in a pot as long as you don't let it crawl away. It's not going to be a problem. It doesn't set berries. Um, it's, it spreads through runners. But if you'd like to replace it, I suggest uh, woodland phlox, phlox de varicata, a native that is so pretty. Asian wisterias, a stunning, beautiful plant. Uh, my own parents grew this, and when they finally realized that it was eating their back patio uh, and wanted to get rid of it, they were dealing with it for years afterwards. Uh, it was introduced from uh, the two different kinds uh, back in the 1800s, um, but it's invasive throughout much of the mid-Atlantic and southeast. It has these compound leaves. Uh, the vines twist around trunks and will kill the trunk that they're, that they're growing up. And um, often, in fact, it grows in the shade, but it likes the sun. And so it kills the trees that it's growing up, which will then fall down, creating more sun. And it seems to, to work out as a strategy for the wisteria. Um, you probably need to use herbicides because it really aggressively resprouts. I have been in a backyard that was completely covered with wisteria, we actually had to duck to come in under the wisteria. And um, that really probably needed a professional, you know, invasive remover company. Um, but you can cut it and treat the lower part portion with systemic herbicide. You can see they grow huge and woody. This is a 10, 11 inch uh, piece of trunk. We do have a wonderful native American wisteria that is just as pretty. The flowers are a little bit smaller, but it looks very similar and it's a great replacement. Barberry. This is one that has been in the US since 1875 in the ornamental trade, and it is still widely avail available. Uh, it's on the invasive list throughout the Northeast. It produces berries that are not nutritious for the wildlife, but are eaten and dispersed widely. Um, interestingly, this one, when it builds up leaf litter, it can cause a pH change to the soil. Um, there was a, quite a, a big study done in Connecticut that found that barberry serves as a, kind of a vector because it provides habitat for white-footed mice and ticks. Um, the ticks not only are abundant in the barberry in the wild, but they are also active for more hours of the day when they're uh, living around barberry. Uh, it can be dug out or treated with a systemic herbicide. And if you want to replace it, consider Virginia Sweet Spire, Itea virginica, one of my very favorite native shrubs that um, has cultivars in various sizes. It's a really useful wonderful shrub. Burning bush, which is so common around us all over the neighborhoods that I go through, Euonymus alatus. It was brought from Asia around 1860 and again, very widely available in the nursery trade. It is 
considered at high invasiveness risk throughout Virginia and much of the East Coast. It colonizes by root suckers and is spread widely by birds who eat the berries. It really can look different in the wild. I thought that it wasn't common in the wild. I thought this wasn't such a bad invasive until I went out with some other people who are better at invasives than I am. And they started pointing out and in the wild, it looks quite different. It's not trimmed, it's not as dense, it, it's much airier and um, <coughs> often doesn't turn quite as red in the fall, but it is out there. I can promise you at Potomac Overlook where I was looking, it was surprisingly common. Uh, it, people love the bright red, color, but its easiest way to identify it is these wings, these kind of weird flanges that go up and down the stalk, and they're kind of corky. Um, and it is it has another name, winged euonymus, as a result. Um, you can pull seedlings, or single shrubs can be manually dug, or if you've got a whole bunch, you can cut them back and use a systemic herbicide. And you can consider as a replacement red chokeberry, Aronia arbutifolio, which is a beautiful native shrub. Privets. There are several different kinds of privets. Um, first introduced in 1852. Um, none of the privets that are around here are native. Uh, and they're invasive through much of the southeastern United States. They have glossy over oval leaves. Some of them are smaller, some of them are bigger. They have a compound that native insects cannot eat. Uh, the berries, however, are eaten and distributed by animals. Uh, it forms big thickets of this, and it really does spread. I've, I've seen it coming up in many places, yards and in the wild where I know nobody planted it. Uh, they can be dug out or treated with a systemic herbicide. And if you like the look, our native inkberry, Ilex glabra, is really attractive, uh, evergreen shrub that comes, it's, it's dioecious, so you want both a bunch of females and one male uh, in order to set those pretty dark berries. So, Silk tree or mimosa. This is such a pretty tree. When I was a child in Los Angeles, my mother requested a silk tree uh, because back then nobody had any idea that it could be invasive. It was introduced from China in 1745 as a showy ornamental, which it really is, but it's invasive now everywhere and in our national parks. It has these really delicate and distinctive uh, fern-like twice pinnate leaves, and it has these pink pom-pom-like flowers. Um, it's not a very big tree, it's 10 to 50 feet. Um, but this time of year when it's in bloom, if you walk around in some of our wild spaces, you will see that it has widely spread into the wild spaces. It spreads both both vegetatively and by seeds, which can maintain viability inside their tough seed pods, which you can see here for a number of years. Um, those seeds can float away, and that's why they're often along streams. Uh, the new sprouts are easy to pull, they're easy to recognize, and you can pull them out pretty easily. Um, but full-blown trees are probably going to require um, a cut and herbicide to kill the re-sprouts. But we've got a beautiful uh, replacement, Eastern Red Bud, the Circus canadensis, uh, is, is a really beautiful native small tree that you could put in instead. Calorie pear, Pyrus caloriana, um, was introduced from China in the early 1900s. And then in the 1950s, the Bradford cultivar was developed as an ornamental and widely promoted and planted very widely. And if you want to read a fascinating story, um, the Washington Post back in 2019 told the story of developing the Bradford pear and how it went so wrong. Um, it is widely spread now through the Eastern US. If you drive up and down I-95 in spring, 
all those white trees in bloom are calorie pears. Uh, it forms dense thickets with natives that natives cannot compete with. It spreads by seed and vegetatively. The animals spread it all over the place. It has this odd problem. You can see um, this broken tree here. It's known for having very narrow angles to its branches that break really easily and are a real pain to deal with. Um, the seedlings and young plants can be pulled or cut, but mature trees uh, must be cut down and, and the stumps treated with a systemic herbicide. But you can replace it with one of our most beautiful small uh, trees that has beautiful white blooms. This is the fringe tree, Chinanthus virginicus. This is my front yard. And every year as this blooms, it just makes me so happy. The Rose of Sharon, Hibiscus syriaca, is a tall shrub, small tree, depending on what you look at. Um, the name Rose of Sharon is from the Bible, and there are a lot of plants named that, but um, this one is usually Hibiscus syriacus when you say Rose of Sharon here in America. Uh, it is all over the place and widely available uh, with many cultivars. Uh, this bloom here is a cultivar with double blooms. Um, the seedlings can be pulled, especially if the soil is damp. I've pulled many myself. Um, they're little woody seedlings. Uh, larger ones need to be dug out. Um, you can replace it with this stunning native, the scarlet rose mallow, Hibiscus coccinius. And now at the very end, we've got some that are possibly going to be hard for you to take because a lot of people really love these, even though they're invasive. Breaking up is hard to do. Lily turf, monkey grass, the various kinds of liriope. Uh, this is so widely used. Um, they were introduced as ornamentals, and there's a couple of different kinds. There's a variegated uh, muscari, uh, but there's also the Liriope spicata, which spreads by rhizomes. It has a very narrow, strappy leaf as opposed to the clumping muscari. And you can kind of see the difference there between the two. They infest the woods adjacent to neighborhoods and ab abandoned home sites. The seeds are spread by birds and mammals. The spicata runners can travel under cement and the rhizomes can be spread when soil is moved. If you try to dig them up, you've got to be pretty careful. Um, you can limit the spread of muscari by cutting off the berries before they mature. The berries are here. Um, and if you just whack those off in the late fall, uh, it'll only, those clumps will get fatter, but they're not going to travel very far like the spicata can. They're both considered invasive, but honestly, the spicata is worse. Um, if you want to replace them, this is kind of an unusual suggestion, but I love the Christmas fern, which has the same dark green color and is evergreen. It's a great native polystichum. I'm not even going to try the second one. Okay, there we go. Heavenly bamboo, Nandina domestica. This is one that is everywhere in Northern Virginia. I feel like, um, you know, I couldn't really say a third of the houses I look at have Nandina, something like that. It was introduced to the US in 1804 as an ornamental and is still widely available in the nursery trade. Uh, it is definitely invasive. It colonizes by rhizomes and by animals that eat the seeds. Um, unfortunately, those berries can be toxic to wildlife and domestic animals if they're eaten in quantity. Uh, the birds that eat just a little bit and then poop them out are usually fine, but some birds that like to gorge on berries, such as cedar waxwings, have been found to be killed by these. So you can limit the negative impact 
by cutting the berries off each year. There are a couple of cultivars that are supposed to be sterile and safe options. Again, we don't know how long that'll last. Um, they can be dug out. You can remove all the roots or you can use chemicals. Uh, if you'd like to replace it, I love strawberry bush, Euonymus americanus, our native Euonymus. It has these super cool fruit that I chose this picture because of the wonderful fruit. But uh, just a little bit later in the season, it actually, these leaves turn colors that are very similar to the autumnal colors of the Nandina. So it's a great choice. Butterfly bush, I'm sorry, I know a few people are probably having your hearts broken right now. Um, it was introduced from China as an ornamental shrub in the early 1900s. It is on both Alexandria and Arlington's invasive lists. Um, the nectar absolutely does support the butterflies, but uh, the nectar attracts the butterflies, but uh, none of our local butterfly babies can live on this plant, the caterpillars. Uh, it does not support their reproduction. And in fact, by offering such copious nectar uh, to the butterfly, it diverts them from other native plants that need the pollination. Uh, it escapes by planting from planting by abundant wind dispersed seeds. Um, and it does invade natural habitats very easily, displacing the nat native plants. There are sterile cultivars, um, but again, they've, a lot of them have been found to revert to being fertile over time. If you want to replace it, I cannot recommend anything more than buttonbush, which is such a butterfly attractor, and it has these super cool, round, beautiful flowers. And the last one, the, the worst heartbreaker of them all, everybody seems to love Japanese maple, uh, the Acer palmatum, and, you know, if you see a new house go up, they're almost inevitably going to have a little Japanese maple planted because people just really like them. They've been imported from Asia since the 1800s, uh, but it is on Arlington's invasive list and considered invasive or a threat through much of the mid-Atlantic. As we plant more and more of them, we're just increasing that threat. The prolific seeds can escape cultivation and spread into forests and along roadsides and streams. Um, and they're just going to keep escaping. They often, like the burning bush, look different in the wild. So if you say, oh, I've never seen one escaped, it, it probably looks different than the ones that we see in yards. Um, the seedlings are very easy to pull. Mature trees may be dug or pulled out or treated with herbicides. And a, really interesting replacement. I thought, oh, let's have something that's that's really cool looking. Our native witch hazel, uh, which blooms in the fall and has these beautiful yellow blooms, uh, would be a great choice. And I'm so sorry that we're running over on our presentation, but just a few final thoughts. Uh, if your favorite plant just got outed, don't get too discouraged. We've all had that situation. If you can't bear to remove it, you can try to keep it in check and replace it if it dies. Uh, keep an open mind. If you fall in love with a native plant, uh, you may find that that native, which is so beautiful, um, you won't mind as much digging out the invasive that, that you thought you loved. Uh, if you feel like you've got too many invasives and you're overwhelmed, just pick one. Just pick one that you can do something about and work on that one. When you're done with that, you can move on to another one having had some success. And I really encourage you to start somewhere and feel good about each invasive that you remove. That's it for my presentation, except for the last questions. Thank you so much, Alyssa. That was fantastic. Um, we have so many positive comments and the, the feedback. Um, I know we're over time, um, but there was really just one question outstanding, and that was about whether you knew of any invasive removal efforts that are happening with the calorie pair. Um, I I really don't. I know that I know that 
all over the place. People are trying to remove them, but I haven't heard of ones that are specific to that. I'm sorry, I wish I, I had. I, I'll try to do some research and if I find something, I'll put it in the comments that will be posted when this video gets posted after it's closed captioned. Okay, and then that's just uh, a great reminder that this video will be up in a couple of weeks on our website at mgnv.org, where you can also see our upcoming calendar of events. Again, thank you so much to Alyssa for a wonderful, just information-packed presentation. And also, I forgot to give a shout out to Leslie Fillmore, who's been managing the chat box during this whole talk as well. Uh, it takes a team to pull these together every week. So thank you to everyone. Thank you for joining us and have a fantastic weekend, everyone. Thank you.